you first and then I. Yeah, I, I do the introduction in a second. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wait a second until everybody's in or most people are in to, to start. There are still some people uh, joining. Okay, uh, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, this week's VSAT. Um, we are very happy to have Laura Feldkamp, who is uh, presenting a model of the data economy that is joint work with uh, Mariam Fabudi, who unfortunately uh, cannot join us because she's stuck on a plane. Um, and we are also very happy to um, have uh, two expert panelists, uh, Philippe Aguillon and Robert Ulbricht. Um, who uh, will ask questions during the talk and make it more lively. Um, so since there's no co-author today, the chat is not really monitored. Um, so if anybody uh, of you in the audience uh, has a, a, a important uh, clarification question uh, or a general question, uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and just ask it or postpone it until the Q&A at the end um, or also um, uh, save it for, for the um, uh, academic, uh, the, how is it called, the multiverse? <laughs> uh, uh, all right, so uh, next week uh, we have Scott Cominas um, who is presenting Infin to infinity and beyond uh, scaling economic theories via logical compactness, which will be the final seminar of this year. Um, so, ah, and finally, um, uh, let me remind you that the talk is as always recorded. So if you don't want to be in the recording, uh, don't uh, say anything. <laughs> All right, uh, that's it. Um, Laura, yeah. Uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Diana. Okay, very good. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me today. Uh, this is a model of the data economy and it's joint work with Marim Farbudi. So the, the question is, you know, really what's going on with the data economy? Um, how can we think about it? How can we think about policy? How can we make forecasts? Because the fact is our economy is changing and we need new tools to think about it. The largest firms in the world today are valued primarily not for their buildings. I'm sure they have wonderful employees, but we attribute most of the value of these really large firms to their data. So there's an enormous amount of economic value and economic activity that's associated with the data economy. And yet the tools that we use to think about the aggregate economy kind of look like an industrial economy, right? We're combining labor and capital and making these physical rival goods you could call widgets, right? Or services or what have you, but it's not really about what's going on with these large firms and to a lesser extent with all firms in the economy that are increasingly using data to inform the decisions they make. So, in light of this, you know, we're moving, we're going through the shift from an industrial economy to a knowledge economy. Let's try writing down some structures that we can use to think about the knowledge economy, to think about, to measure the knowledge economy, to think about policy and knowledge economy and so forth. Let's think about sort of a new DSGE structure that really has data as a valuable asset in it. And then ask questions like, well, you know, do the economics change? We'll ask, is long run different? Is the short run different? You know, or is data just a new form of capital? And we can sort of incorporate it and then go about our business kind of like we did before, except instead of, you know, buildings and machinery and equipment, we're, we're, we're calling it data. And to some extent, each will be true. So the contribution here is not so much a particular prediction. This isn't a theory paper that's saying, you know, there's a fact about the world and I'm going to advance a new explanation for it. It's more like, 
introducing a model, a structure, a dynamic structure that's a tool. It's a tool for thinking. It's a tool for policy and it's a tool for measurement. And I'll show you how we might use it for in, in moving in each of these directions. And what success then is, is we want a, a tool that is flexible and that speaks to some of the, the features that we see of the data economy, particularly the features that, that look a bit odd, that look different from, from a standard economy. Now, in, in coming up with this kind of structure, this model, there are a bunch of challenges. The first is that a lot of data comes from economic activity, right? Economic activity, you, you go online and you buy something, generates informative data. It's you know your, your name, your address, your zip code, what else was in your shopping basket? How frequently do you go to this website? Um, maybe you're using an online service like a navigation tool and it's generating data about where are you driving? How fast do you drive? Well, Laura, can we you stop along you? the way? Can yes. we interrupt with questions or sure, how is it going? Or oh, it's comments up to... No, but Good. for example, you know, I, 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 you know, there are the multi-arm bandit models, you see, yes. experimentation model. Yes. I work with Patrick, you know, we yep. have in common one co-author, Patrick Bolton, and yep. we, we had a paper on experimentation long time ago. And in the decision what to charge a price, it was a trade-off between, you know, how much sales you would make in the short run and how mm -hmm. much information mm -hmm. you would acquire. Yep. And uh, that will so, be here. Uh, is that a special instance of what you are after, these experimentation models? Yes, so that's one feature that we want a data economy to have. We want it to look something, it's not exactly going to be structured like a bandit problem, but it's got that flavor that the more you produce, the more information you generate. And that sometimes you're not going to want to produce and you're actually, firms might make losses from producing. They might sell stuff at below marginal cost, right? Like I bet you've got a phone with a whole bunch of free apps. Well, I'm going to put free in air quotation marks. You did not pay any price for probably for your navigation app or your scheduling app or your flashlight app or all kinds of things that somebody paid to develop, right? And so why are those firms providing those? Well, they're, they're providing them in return for data, right? So there's, there's a kind of barter going on that um, you know, has some of this flavor of, I might pull a handle even if there's an expected loss there as a bandit um, in order to generate information. So that's gonna be one feature we want this model to have. Now, if all we were doing was doing an active experimentation model, you've already done that, right? Problem solved. <clears throat> However, we want another feature for a data economy, which is this information is gonna be used for multiple periods. So we wanna have, think about data as an asset is a long lived asset. It's not forever lived. It's going to depreciate. We're going to have to think about how to depreciate it, but we want a dynamic programming structure where information is a state variable. The right? problem is that information, of course, can be, the problem is that information can be used by competitors. Yep. It, so absolutely. we know in particular, the mm -hmm. other experimentation model, like for example, Raphael Robb had this kind of model where, you know, who enters first the market and you free ride on the other guy because he would go into the market and get information and mm -hmm. you would make use of that information, but the cost would be borne by the first entrant. Yeah. So, uh, okay. so there is the issue, I guess, of uh, how proprietary or not the information Absolutely. can be. Yeah. And, uh, we'll wrestle to some extent with that. So, so we, want, we want that there's dynamic programming, right? That this is a long lived yeah. asset. We want depreciation, but depreciation is not a straightforward sort of rate when it comes to data, how quickly data depreciates, it depends on how much the environment is changing, how out of date that changes. So depreciation itself is an endogenous object. And then the third is data is a non-rival good, right? You can use data and I can use data. We can both happily do, you know, estimations on the same data set, but at the same time in a competitive environment, um, if somebody else is using the data, uh, it might, its economic value might decline for me. So we want to wrestle with those sort of, you know, it's, it's technically non-rival because we can both use it, but it's sort of semi-rival in that when other people use it, it's, it, it is well, less There is a bit of that too in the economics of media. I mean, you know that literature, no? Genskao et al. There yeah. is a bit of that, you know, once Absolutely. you disclose the, the, the news, there is no point, you know, uh, preventing anybody from disclosing. And uh, uh, so are you borrowing from there a bit? Do you it will have the... aspects that the point is to take these insights from all of yeah, these different literatures in a, in a single and combine model. it into one in a, yeah. in a tractable way. Okay, okay. Right, that's, that's the goal, right? So I, I don't think, look, nothing we ever put in a model is entirely new, right? It's, we are, we are- No, but what's interesting from... is the interaction, of course. What's right, the... exactly, exactly, okay? So the model is gonna be a recursive framework 
and I'm going to work hard and I'm going to have to make specific assumptions, right? This is not theory in the, you know, with a capital T in the sense of we're going to make really general assumptions that are, um, and, and come up with, uh, you know, with theorems that, that appeal, that apply broadly. This is going to be, I've, I'm going to have to use linearity here and I'm going to use normality here and I'm going to use a quadratic here, but out of those specific structures, I'm going to get a lot of tractability for a model that's got all these different features, right? Typically, the kinds of models that Philippe works with that, you know, are, are active experimentation are pretty complicated. So adding that to a production economy with equilibrium prices and with, you know, information leakage and with endogenous data depreciation and all of this stuff could be a mess. And I'm going to show you a way to make it not a mess, right? To make it look like a pretty standard macro model. We're going to learn how to depreciate data from that structure. We're going to look. We're going to learn how to value data, even data that had zero price, right? Like I explained to you, this data barter. You use your navigation app. There's no monetary price for exchanging for for paying. You know that that you paid for that, but you were exchanging it for your data. Um, we're going to be able to put a, a a value on that, even if it had zero monetary price, and that will help us come up with a better way of thinking about the value of data intensive firms and inform GDP measurement, okay? So, so we're gonna talk about, you know, the, there's a whole um, segment of economic activity that economists are missing right now because we weight stuff by price. And I really value my navigation app. It saves me a ton of time. I'm certainly willing to pay for it, but the truth is the price I paid for it was zero in terms of, you know, dollars, pounds, euros, what have you. Okay. So then out of that structure, we'll get some predictions. The predictions I think of as secondary, really the contribution is the structure. But the predictions will be that the long run forces are pretty similar. And the long run data is kind of like capital. Uh, it won't sustain growth if you just accumulate it unless you use it for innovation. If we use it to come up with better ideas, it'll sustain growth. And we're gonna have economic efficiency from this structure unless we add data externalities. But the data economy that I described to you by itself won't be the source of inefficiency. But the short run is very different. But that, that I don't, yes. don't, don't see. If I generate data, mm -hmm. it will be good. Other firms can use my data, so it's good for them, no? How well, come you don't? I, I'm missing ownership. something there. I mean, how come you don't have externalities there? I will give you property rights over the data you generate. So I don't get to see if you sell no, but something like you to can Julia. Have property rights on an innovation. What, but, but, but you still have externalities involved. I mean, when you innovate, okay, you have a patent, for example, whatever. Yeah. So you yeah. get, you're the only one, you have monopoly rights on exploiting your, your, you know, your invention. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, other people can build on it. Yep, absolutely. And so yeah. when you decide yeah. how much to invest in uh, innovation, you don't internalize yep. the, you know, all what subsequent people will be able to get from building on it. How come you don't have that with data? I think this is one of the fundamental differences between ideas and the kind of data that I'm talking about, okay. which is evidence of economic transactions, right? If you come up with a better way to do economics, I may take ideas from that and use that to, you know, also do better economics. There's spillovers to ideas. But if you do a transaction with Julia, I am unlikely to remember the date the address, the credit card, zip code, the entire basket, and sort of have that generally inform me without physically stealing that data, right? So this kind of transactions so based I, so data the, isn't so a broad idea that I could use. It's very specific numbers that would be difficult to, um, to leak without it actually, you know, trying to steal the, the records. Oh, so that you, are mean, you mean by that, that, for example, I experiment, Mm -hmm. uh, other firms cannot take advantage of the information generated by my, my experiment. Unless I That's sell it to them. So we'll have a market where I can sell you the data. Okay. 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 But, but this isn't about, I'm going to get an idea okay. broadly okay. about okay. what you're doing. Okay. Okay. This okay. is you sold to the, mm -hmm. you know, these mm -hmm. goods to these people also bought this stuff. And it's very, most of this stuff is very specific information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's that I think of as kind of okay. just a fundamental okay. difference between mm. the kind mm. of data I'm talking mm. about mm. and the kind of ideas that you know that that you put into models, right? Okay. So um, so the the long run is is familiar, but the short run here is going to be different. Apologies for the the typo here. We have increasing returns. I'll describe to you a data feedback loop that arises. 
There's a data barter. We'll see a, you know, digital services being given away for free and firms are willing to produce this stuff at zero price. It's a form of costly investment in data. And there are young data firms that will have low book to market ratios and profit losses, right? Amazon made losses for the first 28 quarters of its existence. A bunch of growth firms in the tech sphere look like this. And so, you know, none of these predictions that I'm describing to you are going to be an enormous distance from the assumptions. So I don't want to set you up to expect a theory talk where I, you know, do mathematics and pull rabbit out of a hat. These are predictions that are um, valuable because they convince, I hopefully will convince you that the framework I'm going to show you is a useful one because it can speak to some realistic phenomena that we see in the data economy. Okay, so that's the goal here. That's, that's sort of what, you know, what success would look like. Okay, there's the model without further ado. Okay, the first uh, assumption is my very least favorite one of this model. So let's get it out of the way. Um, this is a first step. I'm gonna have a continuum of competitive firms. And this is problematic. It, um, it also, uh, and I'll show you why, why it's problematic uh, technically. It also is unrealistic, right? And, and a lot of the really interesting questions where we might be interested in in the data economy have to do with competition and yeah. competition. Yeah. I can tell you about a follow-up paper mm -hmm. that wrestles with that. But for this first step to try to think about what does a you know aggregate economy look like, we're going to stay really close to you know something that looks like a standard DSG model with competitive markets. So you know I'm going to hold my nose on that one and say you know this this particular paper isn't going to wrestle with some some really interesting issues, but you know we're going to be able to make some progress along other dimensions. So each of these firms uses capital K to produce K to the alpha units of goods. And these goods have a quality, AIT. Okay, and I'll come back to what is quality and where does that come from? So output, we can think of as being an integral over all firms, or we're gonna add over all these firms, their quality, their units, and you know we're integrating over all firms, IDI. And then there's nothing interesting on the demand side. At the very end, I'll show you a micro foundation that's got households and utility functions and so forth. But because there's nothing interesting there, I just want to do a shorthand for the whole demand side of the equation, which is the equilibrium price is going to be a coefficient P bar and the aggregate quantity produced in the negative gamma. So when firms produce more, prices will be lower. Okay. So I apologize for the sort of you know, not complete description of the economy, but allows to get to the interesting part faster. And I can fill you in on the details behind this at the end. Okay, so now I wanna talk about quality. Quality is what data is used to achieve. So a firm is gonna have an optimal technique. That technique is gonna have a learnable component theta and an unlearnable component epsilon. Epsilon A for quality, I for firm I, T at time T, it's gonna change, it's different by firms, it's different over time. Okay, so this, this learnable component is an AR1, it's persistent, and it's got an innovation eta, which is normal, mean mu, invariant sigma theta squared. And so, you know, here's our AR1 process. Okay, so theta today depends on theta yesterday. It's important that it's got some persistence because that's what's going to make data have value over multiple periods. Data is going to teach us something about theta. And because theta is persistent, something I learned about yesterday's theta is still relevant to know about today's theta, but not perfectly relevant because this persistence isn't one. Then this epsilon piece is unlearnable. There's no data about it and IID. If you think some of this is learnable, you got to roll it into the R1 process, okay? So this epsilon just captures whatever piece of it you think just is pure luck or randomness. So I want you to think about this as like, you know, maybe this could capture fashions or fads, right? Maybe, uh, you know, uh, blue shirts are, are really popular and in high demand today. And I'm going to get some data that says, hey, demand for blue shirts today is sur surging. Maybe I should be producing more of them. Or maybe this has to do with, you know, learning about, um, about suppliers. Or maybe it has to, you know, do with learning about inventory. And, you know, when is there a, a large demand for, for beer? Or maybe this has to do with all kinds of things about the firm's environment, either their revenues or their costs that, um, that, are, that are changing, but have some persistence and then might learn about by doing transactions. Can, Laura, can I ask about this optimal technique? Yes. So I guess, so here you're assuming that it's the same for everyone, but then earlier you were mentioning sort of these, these data 
barter markets. And it seems, so even if you assume that there's non-rivalry in data, in, in principle, you could have some domain specificity. So, um, so like yeah. sort of, you know, Google runs its search algorithms, but it's not clear as much uh, the information they get from this is useful for Amazon uh, pricing their products. Yep. And so, so it seems so, you, uh, it's like an important thing we should like take into account if you think about these data markets. A richer version of this would have correlated thetas across firms. If mm -hmm. they're uncorrelated, then we have no data market, right? Because right. information yep. about my theta is irrelevant for you. Information about your theta is irrelevant for me. And we just never trade. That's fine. This whole model will work except for, you know, we'll just have zero data trade. No, no, no sure. I mean, I guess it's sort of a quantitative question, sort of how right. correlated right. Would, right. are they realistically? I think, you know, one of the things I'd like you to take away from this is that this is a starting point. And I think one of the nice features of it is there are a lot of dimensions on which we could enrich it. And if we really wanted to think quantitatively about measuring the price of data, um, we probably should, you know, take more seriously the idea that thetas are correlated across firms. And we should start to think about, um, you know, which firms are more similar. So like, you know, there are these, uh, right, right. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Gordon Phillips and Hoberg have these measures of, you know, similarity across firms from doing like textual analysis from their, you know, earnings reports and so forth. They give you an idea about how correlated your firm might be with mine, whether we load on similar factors. I think about that as the kind of stuff that's going into, you know, that would determine a variance covariance structure for different firms' data. Okay, so I, I like that idea a lot. Um, in fact, you know, I think theta probably has many dimensions to it. I'm just going to treat it like a scalar here, but we might also be learning about both demand and our suppliers and, you know, different dimensions of demand, aggregate demand for all goods and demand for blue stuff specifically and so forth. And, you know, so I think there, there's a lot of richness one can put in here, but all of that's doable, right? All of making this, you know, a, a vector matrix notation, uh, you know, putting in covariance and that all of that is is stuff we kind of know how to do so i'm gonna i'm gonna set that aside for now but your point is very well taken and i agree that is a more interesting richer model of the world that could be really important for some sorts of measurement questions particularly about the value of data okay so um but for now i'm going to pretend that everybody just faces this this one shock for simplicity just so that we can learn about how the model works so then quality here depends on, you're going to choose a production technique. You don't know your optimal technique. You're going to try to figure it out. And the quality depends on what's the distance between what you choose. You know, do I choose, maybe I choose turquoise sweaters and not quite the dark blue that everybody likes. So there'll be a distance between my chosen technique and the optimal technique. So here is that distance. So we're going to make that distance a quadratic, right? So this is the, this is the optimal. That's what you choose. The difference between those two squared is our distance metric. But then quality could be a function of that. It should be a decreasing function, right? Because if I choose stuff far away from the optimum, I'd like to have lower quality. Um, so, you know, we're going to impose that it's monotonically de decreasing, but it can be monotonically decreasing in, in a lot of different ways. Okay. And that just captures the idea accuracy is good. So I'm going to use data to try to figure out what theta is so I can choose a technique that's close to the optimum. Okay, so at time t, a firm, and a firm will obtain n data points, n i for firm i at time t, about tomorrow's state of the world, theta t plus one. What is that number of data points that depends on how many units that I've produced? So if I do more transactions, I get more data points and a parameter that's specific to my firm. This isn't essential. We can run the model without it, but it'll be interesting perhaps later to think about there's some firms that are really good at extracting useful data from their transactions and some firms that are maybe not so good at that. So data is a byproduct of production, uh, but a firm I has a data mining ability, ZI. Okay, so what is a data point? A data point is a signal about tomorrow's data. But, but uh, there, Laura, I mean, uh... It's very particular. I could be a firm that does all the time the same thing and, uh, and be large and not get many data points, which are interesting. Mm -hmm. And I could be smaller and experiment new things. And so I try right. to, uh, uh, is it obvious that uh, bigger firms get more data points than smaller firms? I mean, it's, uh, is it totally obvious in a sense? Uh, well, 
I mean, it could we could capture some of that to some extent? We yeah. could capture that yeah. with a low ZI. Maybe the big firm just yeah. Yeah. you know yeah. doesn't generate much. But uh -huh. I think what you're getting at is that there might be different kinds of production that would be more informative about some risks than you can, others. You can, it can be a, a choice decision. You can decide mm -hmm. to be more daring. Absolutely. And, and maybe you sell less. Maybe, maybe you know, you know, you may learn more yeah. by selling, you know, by going into yeah. more unknown territories and selling yep. less, actually. Yep, yep. So in this follow-up project I have uh, with Jan Eckhout, it's yeah. about imperfect yeah. competition. Yeah. One of the things we think about is maybe okay. you would try to okay. go to a region of the products there. Yeah, We've got, yeah, yeah. you know, products with different attributes. Yeah. You might go to a region of the product space where you really want to learn about attributes where maybe other firms aren't there and you could esta establish lots of knowledge and dominance in that yeah, area and yeah. get more market power and so forth. So I completely agree with you. Um, you know, I'm I'm keeping a lot of things simple because we're, we're trying to, you know, start with a, a, a framework that's usable, but I think that's another dimension yeah, on which yeah, we can yeah. add a lot of richness. Okay, so, so a data point is about tomorrow's state of the world and it's got some noise and that noise is normally distributed. It's mean zero, we'll say the data point's unbiased, otherwise you would just subtract off the bias and it's got this variant sigma epsilon. Okay, so what this model so far, I'm not quite done with it because I haven't done the data markets part yet, but I just wanna point out that embodied in this model is an idea of a data feedback loop where if you've got a firm that's bigger, it does more transactions with more customers, that firm generates more data, right? That was this assumption right here. Bigger is more K, they get more data points for a given level of Z. More data points will allow this firm to choose a technique that's closer to the optimum, right? Because they each data point gives them information about what that learnable piece of the optimal technique is. So they're going to get they're gonna have a better forecast of theta t plus one. They're gonna choose an action that's closer to it. That's gonna, choosing an action that's closer to this, gonna reduce that distance. It's gonna reduce this, this thing. This is decreasing function. You make your, your quality better, right? So more data allows you to achieve higher quality or more efficiency. Firms with higher quality, more efficiency are gonna sell more. They're gonna to choose to be larger firms. They're gonna invest more in their capital stock. They're gonna end up doing more transactions with more customers that then gets the more data and more efficiency and so forth, okay? So there's this positive feedback loop that's very natural when data is a byproduct of economic activity. But and I just look, want to point out that that's embodied in the assumptions we've put down so far. It doesn't move you away from perfect competition. You, is there, for example, you are, suppose you have a small data advantage over other firms. Yeah. You will not get into monopoly? Because of this, with uh, a continuum of firms that have mass zero, you become a bigger mass zero. A bigger mass zero. Yes, in That's in right. the follow up paper, okay. with this is exactly why people are worried about imperfect okay. competition. Okay. Okay. Right? Now yeah. I can do imperfect competition. I can do the dynamic programming problem. What I haven't yet figured out how to do, you know, yeah. in honesty about where this agenda is going, is how to do the imperfect competition yeah. with the dynamic programming piece okay. of it. Right? So that's, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, we're getting yeah. there, but there are a lot of steps. And yeah, this is, yeah. I, I have mm -hmm. to do this paper first and yeah. figure this out before I can do the interesting question that yeah. you're posing. Yeah. Okay, last piece of the model, the data markets. So delta IT is an amount of data traded by firm I at time T. If delta is positive, that means this firm is purchasing data. If it's negative, it's mean, it means they're selling data. The firm can buy or sell but not both in the same period, okay? I'm not gonna allow you to, to you know, choose Delta both positive and negative at the same date T, but you can buy today and sell tomorrow, no problem. Technically, what does that get you? Why do you need that assumption? Um, because of the non-rival or the semi-rivalry that I'm about to describe. If I don't impose this, a firm could generate data. We could have a money or data machine where I sell to you, you sell back to me. I sell to you, you sell back to me, and so forth. Oh, I see. Okay, and so you're you're not. All of it. Okay, okay. So you're not you're not you're not tracking whether the data are are, are new data. You're just you're just exactly. tracking volumes of data. Okay, exactly. gotcha. Exactly. Okay. If I have uh -huh. imperfect competition, I might not need this to limit the amount of data sales because it's just going to be bad for me competitively to keep selling my data and selling my data and selling my data. Here, there's no cost to selling your data. You don't, if I, if I don't impose it. Um, and so I, I can run into existence problems if I, if I let you buy and sell at the same time. 
But so I think when one often thinks about data, one also often wants data that span. And and so 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 you're you're taking your first cut at this. So you're just looking at volume rather than span. Yeah. And that's okay. That's gotcha. Right. I don't have you. different kinds of data in different domains. There's one Fine. risk. There's a signal about that risk. But yeah. that's absolutely a direction you can go with with this model and think about sure. where am I learning? What am I learning about? How correlated is it? And so forth. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a data price pi t that just clears the data market, equates demand with supply. Now, it's important that data is non-rival, right? That's one of the key features about it that makes it different from physical capital. So a firm can sell their data and they can still use it. So now why don't they do this? The reason they don't do it is because it would lead them to have a competitive disadvantage, right? And then a model with imperfect competition, you can show that we're you know, working towards getting to that, but to, to create a reason that firms don't just wanna sell everything all the time, um, we're gonna impose that there's a fraction of sold data that's lost. You can think of it as it just loses value. So all my data loses a fraction of its value iota. We're gonna need iota greater than zero for a competitive equilibrium to exist in this data market because otherwise there is no reason not to sell anything. There's no, there's no shadow cost to selling. Um, and it is true that many data contracts include prohibitions on seller use. Right, so I can I can sell Robert, my, you know, this data set, and I might say have a contract that says, "Hey, if you turn around and sell Philippe this data that I just sold to you, I'm going to sue you." Right, but a lot of the data we use for economic research, probably there's a contract we signed somewhere that says you are not allowed to go into business reselling this data. Okay, and so those are you know some of the kinds of um, uh, ways in which we limit the multiple, the non-rival use of, of data in reality. Okay, so then the last assumption is simply that there's gonna be a data adjustment cost on the stock of data. And that's there for the same reason you put capital adjustment costs in models of capital of, of firm dynamics in a capital economy, it just avoids one period convergence. Okay, that's the set of assumptions. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about results from the set of assumptions. I'm first gonna talk about how do we value and how do we depreciate data as an asset? So a little bit of the mechanics of how this economy works. Then I'll get into, I think probably very briefly, what happens in the long run, what happens in the short run. Uh, long run will look pretty similar to a capital economy. The short run is gonna look pretty different. We'll have a lot of barter going on. We'll have data increasing returns and with it perhaps poverty traps. And then I will probably only get to briefly mention at the end, uh, welfare and the possibility of an external data externality like business dealing. Okay. So how do we solve this model? So let me start with how should we think about depreciating data? So remember the goal is to forecast this learnable component of the optimal technique, right? That's this theta process, it's an AR1. And we've got some priors, right? We've, we've got some belief about what theta today is and you know, some variance of that belief, some uncertainty. I'm gonna call the inverse of that uncertainty, right? How, how big do we think our squared forecast errors are? That's what that conditional variance is. I'm gonna call the inverse of that thing, the stock of knowledge, okay? So the stock of knowledge is the conditional precision of your beliefs about this, this process you wanna learn about. Okay, so now let me, you know, take as given the, whatever information set you, you have and ask, what are today's beliefs, given what I know at time T about tomorrow's state? Well, if I think that, you know, this expectation is today's state and I say, well, let me apply that expectation of the operator up here to theta t plus one, well, I get rho times the expectation of today's state. This thing's a mean zero innovation. I've got no additional information about that. So my belief about tomorrow is rho times my belief today. I can do the same thing for the variance. What is the Just variance? Just for clarification, is, yep. should there be eyes on all this information or am I missing something? Oh, Why? yes. Yes, there should be. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I'm, I'm sort of doing an abstract exercise. Yes, yes. I should have put an eye on you. Thank you. If I ask, what is the variance of tomorrow's state given today's information? Well, that's rho. I, I have to square the multiplier. So rho squared times the variance. I, I just defined omega inverse to be that conditional variance of today's state plus the variance of this thing. The variance of this thing we've called, oh, sorry, I called that sigma theta squared. I just messed up the notation. Yeah. That's supposed to be the same object as this. My apologies. Okay, so then Bayes' law for normal variables says, how precise is my posterior, right? That's the inverse of this thing. This is a, a posterior variance or a conditional variance. My posterior precision, the inverse of that thing, 
should be the prior precision. Well, this is my prior because I had I had a T, T information plus whatever new information I've learned. Okay, that's what Bayes' law for normal variables tells us to do. This thing is my prior precision. Let's say I get some total signal precision. I'm just going to call it sigma s to the negative two, right? Sigma s squared would be some variance. This is the precision. So that leads us to a law of motion for a stock of knowledge. And this comes straight out of, you know, I could work through this from a Kalman filter, or this is a Riccati equation. But in essence, it comes from Bayes' law. The precision I have tomorrow is this function of the precision I had today about tomorrow's state plus my signal precision. Now, if you look at this, it's kind of funny, right? Because we've got this stock of knowledge yesterday. I'm going to invert it. I'm going to multiply it by persistence. I'm going to add the volatility of the innovations to the state. That's a strange way of depreciating it. It's not the one minus delta. But at some level, this thing does look like a stock, right? I have yesterday's amount of knowledge. I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to add new signal knowledge to it. And I'm going to get today's stock of knowledge. So this is kind of like my investment in data. And this is kind of like my one minus delta KT that we would have from a capital evolution equation. But this tells you about how a state evolves. And what you learn from it is that this discount rate is we're going to discount knowledge more if there's low persistence. Makes sense, right? If yesterday's state is not as relevant to today's state, then whatever I knew about yesterday's state, I'm going to discount it more because it's less relevant to today. And if we've got more volatile innovations to the state, we should discount information more. There's a bigger difference on average between today's state and yesterday's state. Well, knowledge about yesterday is less relevant to today. So, you know, qualitatively, these things make perfect sense, but this gives you a way of thinking exactly how quantitatively should I be discounting data? And the answer is it depends on the volatility of the economic environment we're in and the persistence of that environment. And this is exactly how you combine those two those, those two statistics to get a discount rate for knowledge. Okay, so now that we know how to discount, we could, we could add, that's one ingredient to our model. The other thing we have to wrestle with is this non or semi rivalry. So for data purchases, you wanna add, this is how many data points you generate yourself. This is how many data points you bought. That's the total amount of data you're gonna add, right? So that's gonna go in here in your signal precision you're adding, okay? You're gonna add all of that signal precision to your stock of knowledge. But when you sell data, you have all the data you've produced. Now, delta here is a negative number. So some of that is gonna go away because you're selling it. You don't lose everything you sell. You lose a fraction, iota of what you sell. So this is your net additions, N minus something. Now, notice that what you add is more when you purchase is more than what you lose when you sell. You can think of this as an adjusted price of data, right? Where when we buy data, uh, we, oh, sorry, this should be delta, delta greater than zero. Um, when we buy data, we have a different effective price. And it turns out the price is higher for data sales. When we sell data, Per unit of data we lose, we forfeit, we, we, that goes away because of this iota, because of the seminal rivalry, we're getting more revenue than we pay per unit of data we gain when we buy. That's a negative bid-ask spread, right? So one thing we learned from this is that we can think about semi-rivalry using the same tools that we use for finance for modeling economies with bid-ask spreads. It's just that the bid-ask spread goes the other way. Instead of it being more expensive to buy than to sell, you get more revenue from selling per unit of data forfeited than that you do from, from data purchases, okay? So that's another ingredient in technically how do we solve these kinds of models with the features that we want. Okay, so now we can put all of that together and we can say, how do we value data? So one preliminary, the optimal technique I'm gonna choose, right? That what color of sweater do I wanna produce? will simply be my expectation of the optimal technique. And so the square difference between my choice and the optimum is just gonna be a squared forecast error. Now that's really important because now it means that the conditional variance, which is the expected squared forecast error, is a state variable in my equation. The reason that I wanted a square here is not because like I think economies really look like that or some deep-seated belief about you know, square distance is the right distance metric. 
The reason that I formulate the model this way and with the linear law of motion and with normal variables is because that allows me to characterize the entire state of a firm with one state variable. Okay? They, cannot be, they cannot be multiple equilibria. You know, if other firms decide to sell a lot of data, I would have a different behavior if they don't. Uh, and you could have an equilibrium where everybody sells a lot and equilibrium where they, everybody sells little. Can you? No, you've still you got strategic substitutability, here? just like you do in yeah. most production yeah. economies because yeah. you're going to drive down the equilibrium price of data. So if you sell a lot of data, you drive down the equilibrium price of data. And which that means that you it, want to sell less, which means that you want to sell less, in fact. I that's would want true. to sell less. That's right. Exactly. That's the thing. Okay. Right. And so we're going to get uniqueness okay. for the same okay. reason. And then you get uniqueness because yeah. of that. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's the, the problem with yeah, existence yeah. comes from the negative bidask spread and that not allowing you to buy and sell at the same but it's because you assume, uh, But if you had complementarity in, uh, in the use of data, sure. I, I guess that's that something do you it. don't have in your production function. Nope. That nope. would be very different then. That would be very different, right? And we could think and about... And what rules it out is that you don't have this complementarity between their data and your data. I, uh, do you see what I, I mean? If, I don't know. The imperfect competition work that I've done suggests to me that there's a lot of substitutability, that if you're very good at, you know, forecasting exactly what color sweater everybody wants, um, you know, my benefit from doing that is actually less. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I mean, yeah. maybe you can cook up uh, some other story. There might be some kind of implicit yeah. functional form there, that uh, implicit yeah. assumption, you know, the assumption that we, in fact, you make about functional forms that makes this happen, no? You could imagine- well, uh, your substitutability in the goods market. Yes. And typically, if you've got substitutability in actions, like production, you're going to have substitutability in the value of in information acquisition. Mm -hmm. That when, mm -hmm. when you get mm -hmm. more of it, I want less of it. Now, we can put in externalities that could overturn that, but without additional forces, yeah. that is the natural- It cannot be that you have complementary inputs, for example, and- uh, you get the okay. information so if we some input, I got some about others and they complement each other. If you, you know, produce like left shoes and CS, I produce right shoes. It's more like a CS structure, okay? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. that's if you produce time. left shoes and I produce le right shoes, then when you get more no. data, I want more data. That would be, you know, if, if we had a high degree of complementarity in our, in our goods. I mean, I'm, so I'm making it extreme. Had, uh, if you had CES in the production function with uh, enough complementary, that might change. Well, with enough example. complementarity. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. 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 Um, okay, good. So I've got one state variable. What is that state variable? It's the expectation. How, how what is the, you know, this is kind of like a sum of squared residuals. If you were doing uh, empirical work, right? Here's your forecast. You know, that's like what your, your OLS regression tells you the Y hat is. Right? That's your expected value of theta. That's the realization of the state. How far do you think they are is kind of like your forecast error. This is a squared forecast error. That's like a squared residual. And so this is an expected squared residual. I'm going to invert it. That is, you, you could have you know, this without the inverse be the state variable. That's fine. I'm going to invert it simply because I want to think of more knowledge as being up, uh, but that's just aesthetics. Okay. But this you know, this expected square distance between the state theta and your forecast variable is the single variable that is a sufficient statistic for the state of a firm. Okay, so now we can write down a Bellman equation with just one state variable. And so the optimal sequence of capital and data choices for a firm solves this Bellman equation. The value of the data for a firm, the stock of knowledge, right? This is like a a stock, we're adding investments in new data and we're discounting the, the data as we go. This is kind of like the firm's capital stock, but it's their data stock and it's information. It's being used to forecast something is, this is just their revenue, price times expected quality times units produced, right? That's gross revenue. We've got a adjustment cost in there. We've got minus the cost of data you purchased, but Delta might be negative for a firm that's really good at analyzing data they might have price be zero and get all of their revenue from negative delta, from selling lots of data to other firms. Total, totally fine possibility. You have to pay for the rental rate for your capital. And then you've got tomorrow's value of tomorrow's data stock. We're just going to discount at a riskless rate. We could, you know, we could put in a, a stochastic discount factor and make it fancier. Where the number of data points you get is your data savviness and the number of units you produce. And 
here's the state evolution equation. This is just the discounting data formula I showed you before. It looks a little bit different from what I had before because now in this model, as opposed to the simple thought exercise I was doing a couple slides ago, what you know at the end of the period is your stock of knowledge. You also learn something from seeing your own production, right? When you get to see what the quality you got last period was, you get some additional piece of information that's this. But we have to discount all of that. So we discount it by inverting it, multiplying it by persistence squared, adding on how volatile is the environment and inverting again. That was what we learned about how to depreciate data. So we're depreciating these two pieces of data. And then this is the new signal precision you add on. This is like your new investments in the stock of data. It's the data you produce. That's the number that you got from your own production up here. This is how many units of data you purchased. If you had purchases, you get all the data you purchased. If Delta is negative, you're gonna lose a fraction of what you sold. That's that iota and these indicator functions. This is our negative bid ask spread, right? And then the number of data points, we simply multiply each of those data points by the precision of a particular data point, sigma epsilon squared, that maps numbers of data points into units of precision. And that's how much we add to the stock of knowledge we have, right? So this is new inflows of data, and this is old data depreciated. So you can think of this just like a solo model, right? Inflow. Well, that's the new data generated. I'm gonna think about inflows at the aggregate level. So it's, you know, the whole economy. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, or you could just say, I'm ignoring data purchases or sales right here. I'm just thinking about a, a firm's gross inflow before they buy or sell anything. Outflow is data depreciation. This inflow is gonna have concavity to it. Why is that? Well, for a few reasons, um, I'll get to those in just a second. But the outflow, um, is not actually linear, right? That's not a linear function of omega, but we can show that it's approximately linear for an interesting set. When I happen to just pick some parameters fairly arbitrarily and I plotted this function, and you know, this is what it looks like. So, you know, it, in some circumstances, it's going to be pretty close to linear, but it's not concave. And so what you get is this is inflows. That's outflows. We've seen this story before, right? This looks like solo 56 for capital. You're going to get fast growth, lots of accumulation of data, less and less accumulation of data, and you're going to get to a steady state. So growth stops. So that's just you a picture. Uh, you have that because you have, uh, this, uh, you have this decreasing returns because you have this form of precision that you get closer and closer to the theta bar, no? Is that the... Two reasons. Is that, is okay. that, so I want to address exactly yeah, that. Where does the yeah. diminishing returns come from? There are two sources. The first is that if you wanted to generate infinite growth, you would need a G function yeah. such that there's some amount of precision that would get you infinite quality, right? I mean, that's a very simple stochastic yeah. process, yeah. right? Yeah. If you yeah. had finite quality, you can't grow forever. However, think about that economically for a second. What does infinite precision mean? It means I know today what I would otherwise learn tomorrow exactly. If I know tomorrow exactly, we've got a lot of models with perfect foresight. I have yet to see any of them that generate infinite real val economic value, right? But you would need that. You would have to have that if I know what the state of the world will be tomorrow, I can generate an infinite amount yeah, of it. Yeah, that's yeah, a little yeah, bit of yeah. a wacky economy, exactly, but that's exactly. what you would need mathematically. Mm -hmm. But you would mm -hmm. also need a second thing. There's a second reason, even if you assumed, even if this were true, that we could get to infinite quality with infinite data, you would still have diminishing returns if there's some fundamental randomness. What do I mean by fundamental randomness? I mean something random that is not a deterministic function of something that you could observe today. Because if there's something economically relevant that is not a deterministic function of some piece of data you might observe today, then you cannot get to a perfect precision forecast, right? So if there's something truly random about tomorrow's state, you will never get to zero forecast error. And so then even if G goes to infinity at zero forecast error, if you can't get there because there's something you can't learn, you're still going to have diminishing returns. I see. I see. Right? Very nice. So Very nice. Very if you nice. either don't think yeah, data is yeah, a crystal yeah, ball yeah, yeah. or you don't think crystal balls generate infinite economic output, then you got to have diminishing returns. Right? So it looks a lot like a capital economy. Right? This looks just like solo. This looks kind of like a standard DSGE model, a little bit funny depreciation rate, but, um, but the reasons that it behaves similarly are quite different. 
Okay. So we can generate endogenous growth with this. This isn't hard to do. I, I don't mean to say that data in no way contributes to growth. It's just that data accumulation by itself without innovation doesn't sustain growth. We can have data be an input into innovation. That's fairly straightforward. This, this looks like models Philippe has worked on. We can have a quality ladder. We can have, you know, data is an input into that, you know, change in quality from yesterday to today. We can move forward the quality or the technological frontier. Um, we can do that by forecasting. If we forecast better, we might have a better innovation, right? And we'll have a better step in our quality ladder. Sure, we can do that and we can generate growth that way. What do we learn from that? It's not that anything goes, that data could be diminishing returns, it could sustain growth or whatever, who knows? It's that one should distinguish data used for R&D from data just used for ordinary business process optimization, right? And we do this all the time with capital. We distinguish capital investments in R&D from capital investments in building, you know, bigger buildings or, you know, more equipment or, or whatever. And one we think of as having diminishing returns and the other we think of as, as sustaining growth. We ought to be doing the same with data if we want to think about long-run growth. We should just treat it like that. Can I just do one comment about the diminishing returns? So I guess like one difference to the capital is like this capital, we have sort of data on the diminishing returns of to capital. But here, like with your pure limit argument, um, I guess it's just a limit argument. So that doesn't prevent uh, an economy from sort of, you know, uh, going on with almost perpetual growth. And uh, as long as we have, like, you know, as, uh, we don't have infinite precision. So I guess sort of in ter terms of practical predictions, I, I guess there, there is sort of a difference here. Um, you know, I, I find Solo's insight very useful that accumulating capital by itself won't sustain growth forever. And once we've got enough of it, um, you know, we're gonna see things slowing. There is a paper by, um, by Bajari Chernozukov and a couple other co-authors about Amazon that is measuring the diminishing returns they're getting from data. Um, you know, they have enough of it that actually, you know, the, the one billionth observation right. on people buying whatever uh, really is less valuable than, you know, the first few million that, that they got. Um, you know, there, there are some caveats to that when they enter some new product space they've never explored before, you kind of get to start that, you know, diminishing return right, right. process again. Um, but there are some estimates of this, this that, you know, for big, big data firms, that there are, there are noticeable diminishing returns. So I think we yes, can, you know, use that to quantify this, but I think it's yes, also be cool, I guess. Yeah. to think through formally, you know, almost philosophically about what would it take you know, to have data alone sustain the economy. Is this a new economy? Are we going to keep going forever, right? I mean, we hear a lot of this hyperbole and, you know, no, unless you're using the data to do old fashioned innovation, you might be doing it better, but unless it's devoted to that purpose, just like capital, you know, if we build more labs for experiments, sure, sure, sure. we can grow, but- But I mean, but it could be sort of a million years until we converge to that steady sure, state. But that could have been the same for capital too, right? That's- But, it, but there we have- more data, which, which gives us sure. a sense of the like. Sure, that doesn't takes. make the framework less valuable. That just means we should do more research, right? We're, right, right, right. we're just at the start of this, right? I can't, I can't replicate fifty right. years, <laughs> you know, seventy years. Or but for, for example, uh, uh, Laura, I mean, you know, they have models of capital embodied technical progress, for example. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Could you imagine similar things with data? Okay. Would you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, technology embodied in data? And you have progress in productivity, and then the data keep going. Would that change, Marat, what you do? You see what I mean? If you pursue your analogy with capital, okay, mm -hmm. uh, you have this kind of, for example, you know, this kind of vantage capital models or whatever, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, that uh, embody technology and you have different vantages. Could you imagine similar things with data? How far can you push the analogy? And then maybe some of the things would change. Then you, then you are no longer in a pure solo model, no? You already looks, are something. Yeah. I don't think data is embodied in capital. No, in no, uh, 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 no. Technical progress is embodied in data. That's what I mean. Oh, oh. You see what I mean? You have models of, of, of capital embodying technologies, you know? You know, capital embodying yeah. technologies. And uh, I was wondering whether you know, you could have similar things with data embodying new technology. So you could imagine technology can go, can grow forever. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And data to which Maybe extent, you know, uh, 
Voilà. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. 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 I. It's yeah. I, guess, I sort of see where you're going. I don't immediately see how to... No, me neither. I don't know what the implications are. But since yeah. you are pursuing the analogy with capital, I was wondering, maybe there might be a reason why the analogy there is not valid. Or is it valid? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can't redo no. all of the... No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 because I but want to are, know what... No, these are interesting per se, Or is it because we are in a, world, in a solo type of world for various reasons? that you are very compelling, that you gave, that maybe, you know, uh, in the same way as you can escape solo mm -hmm. in various ways, mm -hmm. uh, you could also escape the decreasing returns in these other ways while keeping mm -hmm. some main features of knowledge that mm -hmm. you uh, that you spelled out uh, in the previous slide. Well, I, I don't know, you know where that might, covering. you know what might look like um, capital embodied technological change is if we have automated software packages yeah. where I can do AI and come up with a great prediction, even though I don't really understand AI, yeah. right? So TensorFlow, for example, yeah. is this yeah. wonderful software package where you don't have to know that much about machine learning and artificial intelligence. You can feed it a lot of data and you yeah. can get useful predictions. Maybe we want to think about those software packages as kind of being the yeah. analogy to uh, Te technology, you yeah. know, capital embodiment of technological change. Um, maybe that's where I would go with that analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so the short run looks really different. So the long run I showed you has got this, you know, very classic diminishing returns. You know, the reasons for it are a little different, but in the bottom line was kind of nothing new. It looks like a capital economy, not a new economy at all. Same, same sort of laws hold. Um, now I'm going to think about something a little bit different. The thought experiment is different. I'm thinking about a single firm entering where all the other firms are in steady state. Okay. So if a single firm enters, then we can get this increasing returns and then eventually decreasing returns still got to kick in because if I've got, you know, if I've got a billion data points and I'm Amazon, then a billion first isn't, you know, all that valuable for reducing my, my forecast error. But early on, what happens with my stock of knowledge is I get a little bit more. So now I can produce better quality goods. As I can produce better quality goods, I do more transactions, I get more flow of knowledge. And so the flow is increasing in the stock, right? And that's your increasing returns. But it also means that I could get kind of stuck down here, right? I could be growing really slowly for a while because I don't produce very high quality stuff. Why don't I produce high quality stuff? Because I got no data. Why do I have no data? Because nobody wants to buy my low quality stuff because it's not very good, right? And so you can get small firms that stay stay small for a while. Now, th this is a particular uh, graph. There's nothing, you know, this isn't exactly tangent all the time or something like that. All I want to show you is they're naturally generated inflows for a firm. But then there's also, you know, that's different from, sorry, there's data production for a firm and then there are the total inflows. So one of the ways a small firm might help get itself out of this sort of slow growth problem is that they're buying data from other firms. Okay, but you know, there exists parameters and a threshold such that down here where knowledge is scarce, that net flow is, data flow is increasing over time. So this firm is growing at an increasingly fast rate. And so, you know, this means that firms could, could be stuck in something that kind of looks like a poverty trap where early on they've got low, they've got negative profits. They're losing money. Why are they producing? Why don't they shut down if they're losing money? Well, losing money is a way of generating transactions and generating transactions is a way of generating data, right? So producing at negative or zero prices, this is like giving away your your navigation app or your, you know, whatever app for free is a way of generating data. And that's a costly investment in the future value of the firm. So the book value of this firm looks terrible, right? They've just got debt and debt and debt, but eventually they're going to come become profitable. The market value of this firm is not negative. It's positive. So early profits are, are going to be a hallmark of a small firm entering in this kind of environment. That looks kind of like what Amazon went through, what many small tech firms that don't make any profits for, you know, for years look like. Um, book value here only includes purchased data. So that's in just the rules of accounting. We do not count as in the book value of a firm data or any intangible asset that is generated internally. 
Okay, so that's why this this book value looks looks really and, good. And so here this is very a firm uh, with a, a low booked market. It's very crucial that you can resell your data because otherwise you would get back in Raphael Robb's kind of world where other firms would free ride on you. They would let you make losses mm -hmm. and they would free ride on your information. But right. here you don't because you, you have complete markets here. Well, you you have, data. Um, that's, that's crucial, no, I guess. You have property rights over your data. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. But, you know, there are strong property rights. If, you know, no, 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 Google no, no. is that's making a lot of money and Facebook's making a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, of course. That's not to say there's no no leakage, but there's a no, lot no, no, of money being right. made yeah, by yeah. selling data to other people. And yeah. so that's, and I think, you know, back to our previous discussion, this data is a little bit different from, you know, how do I do this technological yeah. innovation, right? Yeah. How do I make an iPad yeah. or how yeah. do I generate this chemical reaction or sort of, sort of process innovations, I think are much more amenable to leakage then yeah, how yeah. much did I sell to Robert yesterday and what else was yeah, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, we're going to get data barter. You could get sales at, at yeah. zero price. We have a ton of data barter. The stuff's not being counted in GDP yeah, because we yeah. wait price times quantity and we have a way of valuing it, right? Now we can value that because we have a value function. And so we can figure out what's the marginal value of the data being generated and we can value that transaction at that marginal value. Right. So this gives you a tool for starting to think about how do we fill in missing GDP that comes from the data barter economy. All right. I don't have time to go through all the details of welfare. I should be wrapping it up soon. Let me just say we can write down a microfounded household problem. Remember, I, I apologized early on for having that reduced form for the demand side. We can fill that in with utility functions and budget constraints and so forth. When we do that, the bottom line is then we can think about efficiency. You can't think about efficiency if you don't have household utility functions. So then we can compute efficiency. And it turns out the social planner optimum for data is the decentralized optimum. So there are no externalities here, right? Everybody's got property rights over their data and it, the non-rivalry alone doesn't negate efficiency. The increasing returns alone doesn't negate efficiency. There's nothing inefficient about this economy as I've written it down. Now, don't take from this, you know, Laura says data economies are efficient. I don't, right? There are real externalities in data economies and we can build them in. So this is a, a you know, practical way of building it in, but the inherent properties of the data economy I started from do not by themselves generate, yeah, yeah. right? Why is there lots of efficiency? Lots of data is used for advertising, right? I'm gonna try to steal your business, right? Here's a way to think about business stealing. We could build it into the quality function. So maybe my quality is, you know, an upper bound minus, this is just my distance of my technique from the optimal technique. That's just the, just writing down a linear version of the G function I showed you before, but maybe there, I add on to that, you know, if Philippe is really bad at advertising, if his uh, technique is far away from the optimal technique, I'm better off. So that enters positively. This is just taking a trick out of the book of Morris and Shin who use this kind of externality to think about the social value of public information. Um, but this, you could build this kind of term on to your quality function and then say, you know, start thinking about what would welfare look like? What would policy look like in a world where there are data externalities? And we can think about, you know, putting a coefficient in front of here. Maybe this is a big externality. Maybe this is a small externality. We can start thinking about what observables might be, you know, informative about uh, how big this externality is. I, I can tell you, you know, data trade is one of those that's going to be really uh, sensitive to how big this externality is. But, um, you know, this is not going to change from choices, from dynamics or aggregate quantities. It just is a pure externality. It just changes welfare. So data economies absolutely can be inefficient. There's probably a lot of use of data that firms are engaging in that harms other firms. That's going to create inefficient uses of data. Okay, but it doesn't come out of the basic principles that I started from. All right, conclusions. We can't continue to study industrial economies, right? It's, it's, it, we live in a knowledge economy. Most of the people we know are not producing you know, rival goods like widgets. We need modern tools that reflect this reality. So I'm trying to create structures. Um, you know, we can add to them, they're not complete. They don't have all of the features we might want them to yet. But it was difficult to create the structure because knowledge, knowledge economies just have tricky features. Production generates data. So we've got this active experimentation going on. Accumulating and depreciating data are not obvious. You know, we've statisticians, data scientists have been you know, thinking for years about how do we value information 
that pays off over multiple periods. I haven't exactly cracked that. I have one specific instance where we can do that valuation for some kind of you know, parametric forms. But semi-rivalry was troubling. Um, increasing returns are certainly present and decreasing returns are surely there, right? And so how do these two things, how do we combine them? You know, what, what, which one dominates when and so forth? And so here's a model that wrestles with these, you know, these, these features of knowledge economies that seem hard to think through and hard to model. So our contribution here is a tool that captures lots of features of the data economy. There are lots more we can expand it out to, to think more about. It can be extended to think about endogenous growth, about data platforms. If you give a firm a high Z, they're gonna just produce junky goods at low prices and get tons of data. And their, their business model will be just you know profiting from data. And you can get that out of here. We get data barter, business stealing. We can think about optimal policy in this welfare setting. We can think about things like Tobin's Q and book to market and the financial characteristics of these firms. And there are lots of new directions to explore. Like, you know, measurement is a really important one. There are no easy, you know, fixes. It's going to take time. But it also took us decades to figure out how to value buildings that never transact and that are a little bit different from every other building on the, you know, on the block and so forth. So, you know, we, we need some measurement structures to start moving in that direction, but, you know, we'll get there. We want to think about, you know, firm dynamics with entry and exit and imperfect competition. These are, these are you know, on the, the front burner of policymakers around the world. You know, how do we think about competition in a data economy? Um, and data pricing and valuation theory, right? How do we value these firms whose primary asset is, is data? They're a really big part of the economy right now, and we just shouldn't ignore them anymore. So this is far from, from perfect, but I hope it's you know, pushing us in, in the right direction. Good, very good. Good, very good model, yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Very um, nice. Thank you. Um, so now uh, we get to the uh, discussion part. Uh, so um, I don't know if uh, Philippe uh, or you know, Robert, you want to. You know, we, we ask. You know, me. I I uh, <laughs> I don't have. You know, I, I since I had not seen the paper before, I didn't prepare a discussion, and uh, I have lots of uh, you know a question that I ask. Uh, you know, as we moved on, as we moved along, and uh, so I don't have much to add. Uh, except that it's very stimulating. Of course, you know, now I have to digest all this and to ask myself, okay, now what are kind of key empirical features that I could explain, you know, using this framework that would be hard to explain without? You see what I mean? Well, voilà, that's a bit the thing that I, I, I think the mechanics of the model I like very much. I think it's a very elegant model and I can see you can do a lot with it. Uh, of course, I'm maybe stepping ahead too much. Uh, and uh, of course, I'd like to know, you know, what will it add to things, for example, are there things, for example, that we say we, without a, a model, without this data, uh, you know, uh, trading uh, and, and, you know, the, this producing and trading uh, features would be, I would have a hard time uh, explaining this or that. Voilà, that's, but, you know, that I think, don't think it's crucial at this stage. You have a... You have a very good machinery, maybe when you move on to imperfect competition, and then you'll be able to say, you know, uh, we know that in competition policy, for example, there is a lot uh, having to do with data sharing. You know, it's not breakup of firms. It's also data sharing. So I think what's good with this is once you move to the imperfect competition, you will be able to really look at competition policy like nobody else could look at it before because you have the tools to do that. But that will be for the next. So I guess in any case, what you've done is, enormous value and you don't need to address right away the question you know what do i explain all but are there things already that you think this model could explain or help explain that alternative models could not could not account for laura is that other although you know yeah. i don't think it should be judged on that uh, the model uh -huh. anyway. okay I, yeah I, I agree with you that that wasn't the, that wasn't the criteria that i that i set yeah. up but i think it's yeah. interesting to, to yeah. think about um so, you know, one is the presence of these barter trades, right? That's, it's kind of weird that we're just giving away a lot of, um, you know, services that yeah. took resources to develop and that we're giving to customers at zero price. I think it's very hard to understand or think about how to measure this, right? This is now a pretty big part of GDP potentially. And, and we're just assigning zero to all of it, right? I mean, that's not a... a I, well, I guess that the prevalence of this stuff is the observable. 
and the sort of, you know, what's the executable? Well, we're, you know, we're, we're not, we're not measuring GDP correctly, right? We're just missing this whole sector, sector of the economy. Um, in the imperfect competition dimension, uh, you know, we have found a, a lot of neat facts that, that this model with imperfect competition can explain. A lot of them have to do with the different ways in which markups are measured. Yeah. So there's a big debate right now. There are people saying markups are increasing. There are people that say markups are decreasing. Some, some empirical researchers claim that it's pro-cyclical, some that claim that it's counter-cyclical. And um, they differ because of how they're measuring markups. And so it turns out that when you've got a firm that's doing something like this with, with data, if they're using the data to figure out what should I produce yeah. more of, then exactly the level of aggregation you measure the markup at is gonna make a huge difference because they're using data to basically create aggregation effects to produce more of high profit stuff, high markup stuff. And so we can reconcile a whole bunch of facts of people who think that they're disagreeing with each other and say, no, actually you would expect exactly this pattern in industry level markups and firm level markups and product level markups. Um, it's, all it's all explainable with firms that are just processing more data over time. So indeed, like you said, moving to the imperfect competition case gave us a way to speak to some measured facts much more specifically. And data and Laura, uh, another thing is that, you know, there's been work on market for information, mm -hmm. okay? So in which sense, you, you said, you know, data is not the same as innovation, okay, as usually mm -hmm. ideas. Yep. How is data different from information? You know, you have this whole thing, you know, yep. Lafon, uh, people like Jean-Jacques, you know, they work on this economics of information. And, of course, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, can you say why data and information are different? I don't think they are. I think what the data economy, I think data, I think of di data as digitized information. Yeah. But I think what I'm bringing to the table relative to, you know, what these guys have done before is usually yeah. they start from the premise, suppose yeah. you know X and I know Y, yeah. how now do we compete, right? And I'm closing the loop, the data feedback loop, which is, sure, there's nothing wrong with what they've done, but how, why do you know X and I know Y? And where did that come from, okay. right? Well, okay. it came from producing, yeah. right? Yeah. We're, yeah. We're, yeah. A lot of this data not all data, but a lot of data is a byproduct of economic activity, especially the data that firms are using big data. But that's a bit like on. learning by doing models, in a sense. I mean, yeah. that's a bit. That's right. What you do is a very okay. much like, if I, you know, I'm bigger, I learn more. I generate mm -hmm. more information. That's very much the yes. learning by doing. Uh, yes. That's right. So, okay, good. So it's uh, got an element of learning I, by doing. Uh, we oh. just have, sorry, <laughs> I didn't want, I just wanted to, because we only have three minutes left. Oh my God, I didn't realize. Time. I see people. Uh, I oh, just, great I, wait, can I, I just I, quickly, I, I, I wanted to give them an answer to learning by doing that. Oh, really sorry. Yeah. It's yeah. like learning by doing, but learning by doing is usually embodied in human capital. It's attached to a worker, right? And this is an asset that's owned by the firm and that the firm can sell. And so that's the sense of which is different. Okay, that's it. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to also give uh, Robert uh, uh, the chance to say something in the last few minutes before the end of the official thing. Afterwards, uh, whoever wants can click on the link and join us in the academic metaverse and continue the discussion if, uh, uh, if you have time. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Robert, if you have anything. Uh, I mean, I don't want to uh, uh, like take uh, like uh, I don't know uh, add too much time uh, if you're already close to the deadline. But I mean, I, I think it's a really fantastic paper um, and the framework. Um, I think it's a really good toolbox. Uh, I do think that sort of ultimately the payoff um, obviously sort of going to come from like quantifying it more. But that's the first step, and it's a great or like a big sort of achievement of setting it up. Um, and I think. Uh, like not just sort of in a sense like uh, that Philip was sort of pointing out, like speaking to regularities, which we see, but also to make predictions, like things like we talked about before, like, you know, how long does it uh, take for us sort of to uh, reach the information study state uh, where there's no more growth coming from that, or, or how, you know, um, is it something we can benefit from for a long time, things like this. So, I, I mean, like, it's really cool what you have now, but and I don't know if it's the same paper where you will do the qualification eventually, but I think I really look forward to seeing that. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. I, I really appreciate all the, the comments and, and interventions that kept it, kept it much more interesting and lively. So I, <laughs> that, that was great. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. It was really thought provoking. Um, and yeah, so I'll uh, close the official uh, 
part of uh, of the thing. Uh, let me remind you again, next week is the last uh, seminar of the year with uh, Scott Cominas and To Infinity and Beyond. And uh, yeah, whoever wants uh, can join us in the uh, uh, academic metaverse. Um, thank you very much. And thank you to the panelists. Uh, thank you, Laura.